Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to give it a minute or two while um, everyone's joining us. I see lots of people connecting. Great. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jessica Studdett. I am um, the Deputy Chief Executive of New Local. Um, you're all really welcome um, to our event that's in partnership with the Community Wealth Fund. Um, and really excited to have a really interesting discussion today about, about the fund, about what it kind of means to you and your areas and get your, some of your input and reflections and hopefully get you talking to each other and sharing some ideas. Um, just to kind of run over a few tech points before we start. Um, it's always nice to see your faces. So if you are able to put your camera on, that'd be lovely so we can see you. Um, do mute yourselves if you're not speaking, um, just so that we can kind of eliminate background noise. Um, and it's always helpful if you have your correct name as your Zoom uh, title name. Um, so if you're able to change that, if not, that's great. Um, and um, I have my layout set to gallery view. Hopefully you do, so we can just kind of see everybody. Um, but that's just at the top right hand corner if you're if you're not sure how to kind of change your viewing settings. Um, we will be doing a bit of interactivity today, so we will be putting you into breakout groups. Um, and then back for a plenary um, during the hour that we've got you. So just to say, don't ever press anything. Don't worry, it will all be done for you. You'll all be kind of moved seamlessly. So don't don't leave the leave any uh, leave the room at any time. Um, and um, we'll hopefully keep you with us for the whole hour. Um, and there's so many of you. You can see we've got 43 participants here. So please. Please do um, introduce yourself in the chat. We wouldn't have time to kind of run through everyone, but we've got a brilliantly diverse group of people with us. Um, lots of different local authorities and areas represented, lots of different job titles. So please do um, just say hi, who you are and where you're from um, in the chat, and then we'll all kind of get to know each other. Um, and this session is just going to be all about you, your thoughts, sharing ideas and input. So um, really do get involved um, and be keen to kind of um, hear all that. I should say this is not held under Chatham House rules, this is being recorded, um, so it will be made publicly available, um, uh, so just so you know, um, but and please do feel free to uh, tweet how fantastic the event is, if you are tweeting, if you are a Twitterer, um, please use the hashtag CWF week, um, Community Wealth Fund week, um, for any of your tweets um, uh, during the session. So, to get started, um, for those of you who don't know New Local, we're an independent think tank and network of councils and we've got a mission to transform public services and unlock community power. Community power is our core kind of driving mission um, and we work with local authorities and partners up and down the country to um, focus on that. So in that vein, we're really pleased to be holding this event in partnership with the Community Wealth Fund. Um, it's during the first ever Community Wealth Fund week. Um, and we're really excited to have this hour with you all um, to hear about some of the excellent work that's already been done by the Community Wealth Fund Alliance um, and hear more about some of your challenges um, and the opportunities facing your areas and how that, the kind of long term um, community led investment in neighbourhoods um, that's the kind of driving mission behind the Community Wealth Fund, how that would make an impact in your areas and hopefully we'll come out of today with some really interesting kind of in practice ideas as well as a good sense of kind of where the campaign um, is going in the future. So to kick off, I'm really pleased to welcome um, Matt Leach, who is the chair of the Community Wealth Fund Alliance Advisory Group. Um, he's also um, the chief executive of Local Trust. Um, so we're going to start the session hearing a bit from him um, and then just just to kind of steer you through the rest of the session, we'll then get you into breakout groups of three to kind of meet each other um, and share a few of your ideas and reflections. And then we'll come back for a, a wider plenary discussion um, and a whole group, a whole group focus. Um, so and we will be finishing no later than 11 o'clock. Um, so without further ado, to welcome Matt. Um, thanks so much for joining us and thanks for, for partnering with us for this event. I'm really pleased to hear from you. Um, so I guess my first question is, can you just tell us a bit more about the background of um, the Community Wealth Fund and the work of the Alliance? Sure, and the Community Wealth Fund Alliance is a campaign group of now over 450 organisations from across primarily um, the not-for-profit um, local government 
and, and increasingly the private sector. About 50 of its members are, are local and combined authorities at the moment. The campaign's been running for about two and a half years now, and its, its core focus has been to make the case to government that the next wave of dormant assets, which are due to start flowing over the next two to three years, but then could continue to, um, to, to, to flow for perhaps another 10, 15, 20 years, should be dedicated to addressing the massive funding gap we've got around social infrastructure in this country, in particular rebuilding the social infrastructure of communities that um, are often now labelled as left behind. So places where there are low levels of places to meet, not many community-based organisations bringing people together, so low levels of, of, of civic activity. And also actually these are places that quite often are are quite disconnected from from other places so sometimes they lack the connections to be able to bring in resources and make a real difference and over the last couple of years work by by local trust the organization um, that, that, that i work for but also by the all-party parliamentary group for left behind neighborhoods has really highlighted the extent to which in communities which lack social infrastructure where there's not much going on actually you, you see that being very much correlated with higher levels of unemployment, lower levels of skills, really quite profound differences, even when you adjust for relative levels of deprivation, uh, differences in terms of health outcomes and education outcomes. What these places have in common often is that the, their social fabric has been degraded. There's a lack of places to meet, whether it's community centers or pubs, and there's a lack of organizations to, to bring people together. And, and we recognize that to address that, you probably need to be looking at quite long-term investment. Like Local Trust has been doing this for the last 10 years. We've been working in 150 communities around the country. And our, our experience is that to turn around, to turn things around in a, in, a, in a community where perhaps they've lost the tradition of coming together, whether it's because shared places of employment have, have closed, trade unions have disappeared. We've seen the disappearance of, of pubs and other private sector places to meet, perhaps where civic activity has run down. As a consequence, it can take 7, 10, 12 years to start to build that back up. And, and that's the sort of time frame which can't be um, addressed by conventional local authority budgets or indeed treasury financial settlements. It requires long-term funding. And that's what Dormant Assets offers the opportunity to provide. Um, over the last 10 years, we've seen money from Dormant Bank accounts primarily going to, to funding social finance, um, but also a little bit of money going towards um, youth activities and um, to financial inclusion projects. What we'd like to see the next wave of dormant assets, that's money from um, insurance policies, share certificates, other financial instruments that have become detached from their owners, which could be as much as a billion pounds over the next 10 years, committed to um, the task of rebuilding social infrastructure initially left behind areas, but actually, I think in the long term, more generally, because there's an increasing recognition of just how important that is to communities. And so, and I, I mean, I guess you emphasise the kind of long term nature of it um, and, and that investment going straight to communities. Can you just um, um, explain a little bit more about the kind of interaction with local authorities and why why this is kind of um, such an attractive or, or, or why it's kind of um, captured the imagination of different local authorities? Well, I, I was up in the north of England with the chief exec of a large northeastern um, local authority, and we were talking about one of the challenges that he experienced going from community to community and understanding their needs. And he said, you can almost walk from one ward to, to another, both equally deprived. And you'll find that in one ward, it's, it's buzzing with activity. There's, there's stuff going on. There's people coming together, proposing their own solutions. Like traditionally, sometimes the people doing that are the difficult people who can, you know, uh, challenge or, or complain, but they're also the people who try to get things done. You can then cross the border into another community, another estate, which almost feels like it's slumped, where there's not much going on, where maybe the community centre is closed or running on, 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 on shorter hours, where there's a lack of, of self-generated civic activity. And he said the truth is actually all the costs that fall on the local authority fall in the place where there's not much going on. It's much easier to, to work with active communities, to work with them to bring in money from outside, to provide small amounts of money or indeed asset transfers to help them get on with things. And, and also that in, in those communities, 
which are vibrant, where there is really, you know, a rich civic life, a lot of the costs that traditionally fall on, for example, social care, um, don't exist in the same way. People are less lonely, there's less isolation. There's stuff going on to get, get people involved. So there, you, you, you're missing the cost of failure. And actually, if you look at some of the great work that, that New Local's done over the last two to three years, I particularly, you know, the, the work that Luca, you, you Adam, and, 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 and colleagues have, have been putting out, and at, at some rate, the entire community power agenda that you've been highlighting is really important to the future shape of, of, of local government, only really works if there's a community there that's capable of taking power. And that's not something that necessarily happens by magic, it needs to be worked on. And I think as we start to look to, towards the sort of new paradigm that's being sketched out by, by new local, by the local authorities that, that, that work with it, I think we have to recognise that in, in some places it will work, in some places it will take time to work. And we need to make sure that it's not just a solution for, for middle-class areas full of active people and you know um, civic organisation stuff going on. It needs to be a solution and, and a way of working which can work for all communities. Mm. And so kind of in practice and from your experience from local trust, what, what are the kind of types of um, projects that you would imagine would um, get underway and what kind of kind of long-term impact what you know what would you what would you hope for a community 10 years down the line after getting such a such an investment i think all communities are different we know all communities um are different and i think you know one of the if you look back on the last 20 30 40 years one of the great mistakes that um often government makes is to go out into a community find something brilliant and then decide that it should be scaled up and mainstreamed everywhere. Um, when in actual fact, what's often important is not so much that there's a particular thing happening in a community, but that there's stuff going on. So I, I was up in Brinnington in Stockport recently, which, which is you know, a community that suffers from a lot of challenges, particularly around deprivation. Um, they've also got quite high numbers of of people facing issues around, around social isolation. Um, they have been running an incredibly successful and quite large scale community tabletop gaming club. Now, you know, that might not work in the next estate down the road. And I, you know, can't imagine ministers ever wanting to declare that there would be Dungeons and Dragons in, in every neighborhood, but for that community, um, it's a way alongside their community cinema, alongside their growing project of getting people involved, getting them engaged, and then getting them to a point of confidence where actually they can engage with local statutory agencies. They can sit around the table and, and, and discover and define solutions for themselves. They can partner with the local authority to bring new resources in from outside. And at the other end of the scale, if you were to go to Lawrence Western, which is a community in Avonmouth um, that's, that's received long-term funding from, from, from local trust. Um, you see a community there that started off taking some asset transfers from the local authorities and actually some quite shabby community um, spaces, but which has moved on to collaborating with the local authority and with a, a local energy, um, community energy company to, to build a, a solar farm and hopefully soon a wind farm as well, which is gonna generate perhaps 70 or 80,000 pounds of income a year which will help maintain community spaces on that estate without the need for further significant investment from the local authority. So there you can see a community which has moved from taking on assets to building a robust and sustainable business, which you know, won't give it autonomy, but will enable it to, to you know, work in ways and partner with the local authority, um, not just as a, you know, as a, as an applicant, as a, you know, a complainant as a kind of supplicant saying, please, can you fund us? But somebody coming to the table with ideas, with resources, saying, how can you partner with us? How, how can we make a difference together? And I think, you know, that that really, um, in some ways, exemplifies the sort of vision that the new local has been laying out for local authorities as a way in which things might be done in the future. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. It just sort of changes the conversation. Um, so can I just, just um, final question from me, I guess. Um, where do you think the government are at this and what's what's the kind of obviously the leveling up debate is ongoing uh we've just had the big spending review um what's the appetite 
uh, in government for this and, 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 and where has the campaign got to in terms of um, influencing that agenda? Well, I think the campaign's had a, a very good hearing. It's, it's helped because it's, you know, the last two to three years, it's not just gained support from the traditional not-for-profit sector, from funders and increasingly now from local authorities and combined authorities, but it's started to get visibility in Parliament and that, that always makes a difference. So organisations like the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Left Behind Neighbourhoods, which is the biggest um, all-party group formed since the last election, has been incredibly supportive and ac across, across both parties. Um, we've, um, we've seen others, you know, stepping up to the plate and, and committing to the, you know, to this as a policy proposal. So Danny Kruger's report to the, Parliament, to the Prime Minister last year included a proposal for what he called a community levelling up fund. But actually, if you lifted the label off it, it was exactly what the Community Wealth Fund had been proposing. And he's now, what's he sitting, you know, very close to, to Michael Gove's uh, levelling up department. So you have to hope that the message has got in there. And, and more recently in, in Parliament, um, we've seen debate on the Dormant Assets Bill. So this is the legislation government's bringing through at the moment, which will define what happens to that next wave of dormant assets. And, and we've seen speakers from across all three parties in, in the Lords all backing um, a community wealth fund as a purpose for those um, for, for those funds. In fact, more than half of the speeches at second reading of the Dormant Assets Bill um, favoured that. Now, ministers, I think, to be fair, have played a dead bat. It's very hard to get uh, ministers, particularly not Treasury ministers, to you know, to be willing to to commit to um, you know signing checks, e even for a, a cause as, as worthy as this. But if you know, I think some of the signs are there. If you look at um, what Andy Haldane was saying shortly before he was appointed um, as as levelling up SAR by, um, by by Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, he he highlighted in in, in a speech in July in, in July the real link between low social infrastructure and issues around economic ill health, low pay and, and high unemployment. I, I mentioned our research, which highlights the correlation between costs really falling on the state and places that, that lack social infrastructure. And I think government hasn't quite got round to, to talking about it in terms of pol policy solutions. I wish you soon talked about the importance of levelling up communities in, 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 in the spending review, but actually most of what's come out of, out of government in terms of spending announcements have been about economic change. So it's either levelling up high streets or kind of big social fabric issues, you know, the kind of museums and railway stations in the, in, 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 in the centre of towns. They haven't started to talk yet in a detailed way about what they're going to do in hyperlocal local neighbourhoods, in, you know, in the small places, often on the edge of towns or cities, which genuinely have, 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 have been left behind, I think that's going to change. I think there are some, you know, some really good signs and sounds coming out from, um, from Michael Gove, from, um, from Deluxe, uh, from the levelling up team, which suggests that this is an agenda that's being listened to and it's being taken seriously. And in fact, at a Conservative Party conference and only a month ago, we saw Michael Gove launching a pamphlet by a bunch of 2019 um, intake MPs called Trusting the People, which although it didn't call explicitly for, explicitly for a community wealth fund, did highlight very much and, you know, almost all the way through this critical issue of community, of neighbourhood, of putting in place the building blocks, the infrastructure that enables um, institutions to be formed at a local level, to bring people together, to, to activate people, to enable communities and individuals to work and partner with with local government in particular, rather than being entirely reliant on them to do the heavy lifting when it comes to uh, to delivering change. Great. Listen, thank you so much, Matt. That's been really, really good kind of start to the session and hope um, for everyone listening in. That's been um, kicking off some kind of ideas and thoughts in your mind about how how that would work in your areas and what what the kind of uh, local neighbourhoods are that that would benefit from it. What we're going to do now is we're going to move you into um, breakout groups. Um, you'll be put into breakout groups of three automatically. Um, and we want to just um, give you a chance, just 10 minutes now, um, just to focus on identifying the biggest change um, that implementing um, the Community Wealth Fund would unlock in your areas. 
So in your 10 minutes, um, if you focus on two particular questions, what's currently a major challenge for communities in your area? And what are some of the changes that the Community Wealth Fund would unlock, um, particularly obviously talking about that kind of social investment, social infrastructure, and, and the kind of hyper-local um, level of focus of all this. Um, so you're going to have 10 minutes. Uh, you don't need to touch anything. You'll be automatically moved into breakout rooms and you'll receive a notification when um, you're about to be put back into the main plenary and then we'll have a discussion. So um, hope you enjoy meeting each other and have a good discussion. See you in 10 minutes. Hi everyone, welcome back. 10 minutes goes quick, doesn't it? Um, right, now we're gonna have a good plenary discussion. Really interested to hear some of the things you've been focusing on in your um, breakout discussions. Um, so we've got about 20 minutes or so now for a plenary. Um, and um, if you would just indicate if you'd like to speak by um, just raising your hand, we'll try and get to as many, as many people as possible. Um, but just to kick off, really interested to hear what your what your thoughts are on how a community wealth fund or community wealth fund approach um, would make a difference in your areas. Um, uh, Bill, thanks so much for, for kicking off. I'll, I'll go to you. Thank you, Jessica. One, one of the things what um, myself... Uh, oh, sorry, can I ask you to... Why I don't... My bad, can I ask you to introduce yourself, just say where you're from, what you do? Yeah, I'm Bill Chat. I'm a local councillor and I've been so since 99 on a deprived area in Scarborough, North Yorkshire. I was in a breakout group with Eduardo and Jen, and it was a really interesting conversation. The problem is I think local authorities expect results. And sometimes you've got to understand that failure is a good result as well, because you've engaged people. And don't just put it all down to increasing paperwork, putting more checks and balances in there, because all you do is frighten off the people you want to engage. I would say that uh, the other issue which he raised with us, which was very interesting, was some people just don't like to engage with authority. If you walk in there with the wrong badge on, they don't want to tell social workers, kids that, you know, probably aren't being fed well or things like that. But if you're just talking to a guy in the street, they tend to give you more information and then protect them. You've got to use safeguarding. But the stuff we do, uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate because my area is supported by Big Local uh, through Matt Leach's lot. And, and we've done some fantastic programmes and it's not always the cost. Sometimes a hundred quid will achieve a lot more than 10,000 pound, I can assure you. But it's just expect sometimes failure is the result and live with it. I'm really interested in that. From an elected member's perspective, how, how do you deal with failure or how do you enable failure in that sense? Because obviously it's, it, there's a political reality, isn't there? I'm, I'm going to be totally frank. I'm going to say that I don't think a lot of politicians understand what it's like to be in a deprived area. They don't understand the issues, what people are, are dealing with and living with. I, they don't seem to understand some people are not even in a position to actually join a training course. They're not in a position to do anything else. They've got family issues. They're socially isolated. You've got a transient population who come and go, come and go, so you can't build a community up. What you've got to do is you've got to get out there and get people to talk. Talking is the best way to resolve anything. I, with Big Local, have seen some fantastic groups. And, and, and when you talk to them, the good thing about it, every state will have community leaders on there. They already exist. You've just got to identify them, work with them, and give them the chance to, or an opportunity to move forward. And you'll find that they're ready to step up. Great. Thank you. That's really interesting. Anyone else? What, um, anyone else want to kind of relay what, what they um, discussed in their breakouts? Who wants to help themselves forward? Tony, hi. Hi. Go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, I think there's probably a lot of consensus on the need to build up the sort of physical infrastructure and facilities um, for communities. But we, in, in addition to that, we were, I think, all, all agreeing that what's important is the, the social capacity, the organisational capacity to be able to then manage those facilities but also develop initiatives and actions you know across the board in the local area and the problem we've got is that there is such a vast gulf between one community and another in terms of that social capacity 
um, and and the risk the risk of just um, creating another one of these ridiculous government beauty contests where everyone's scrambling and competing with each other to get hold of this resource should we secure it for this purpose is that um, we know where it will end up it will end up in those um, more well healed certainly stronger capacity communities um, and not not the sort of community that bill is representing so we need a more strategic approach and we need to um, invest in building up that capacity in communities through that sort of talking and, and development and, and perhaps providing resource for, for, for community workers based in local areas, um, rather than just jumping straight to a, a competition for money for physical resources. Mm -hmm. So as, as with everything else in, in the government's approach to leveling up, it's about it's as much about how the money is delivered um, as you know what the quantum of money is. And at the moment, we're going down completely the wrong track. It's chaotic, it's not focused. There's a role for local authorities in providing um, linkages to other strategic investments to make sure that local communities can make the best of, of their assets and their opportunities. But, but we also felt that it, it should be led by an independent arm's length body, the investment of this money, rather than getting caught up in the sort of political cycle of, of local authorities. So that was a few thoughts we had. Yeah, no, that's a, some really interesting um kind of practicalities there. Matt, you put your hand up. You, it's not up anymore. I don't know whether you wanted to chip in. Yes, I, 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 I was just going to, to, to endorse absolutely Tony's point that if, if this money comes, you know, is, is delivered, we need to be looking at using it to make long term commitments to places in which social infrastructure needs rebuilding rather than competitive funds that get drawn down by places of um, social infrastructure or, or already exists. And that's very much the learning from 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 our big local program and and looking at Birmingham itself, um, my colleagues were with Liam Byrne quite recently talking about some of the experience, which I'm, I'm sure Tony you share of working with the Furs and Bromford estates, and the extent to which some of the, the major housing investment that's gone in, in into that area over recent years has been enabled and made much easier because of the extent to which community capacity has has, has been built over the last 10 years, and it hasn't been straightforward because actually the Furs and Bromford uh, are areas where there wasn't a lot of civic activity going on. There, weren't necessarily, there wasn't a particularly successful community centre or civic organisations. And it's taken a long time to, you know, to find and develop those, those leaders and to build their credibility locally. But as that started to, you know, as that started to mature, actually it's paid dividends in terms of making the local authorities uh, job much easier in delivering benefits for everybody who lives on on, on the estate. Mm. Um, I can see some interesting kind of comments coming through on the chat. Um, Robert Pollock, you've you've um, put a good summary of your breakout. Do you want to just just speak to your comment in the chat a little bit? Thanks, Jess. It was actually Tony. Tony gave the summary. I was <clears throat> halfway in the middle of writing it. He was far more eloquent, actually, and nuanced. I was interested, Robert, because you're from Cambridge. I'm from Cambridge too. Um, not a traditionally like left behind area when you look at the country nationally. Um, so, what's what's your sense from 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 a, a place like Cambridge of what something um, like this would do for your area? Well, the the, the random breakout rooms. I was put with a, a colleague, another colleague from Cambridge, uh, Mark <laughs> Freeman, yeah. who who runs the um, the local uh, VCS um, organisation. And I think we focused on an area in the east of Cambridge where there are high levels of deprivation, where social infrastructure is low, where there are some assets owned by um, local authorities, um, but there's been probably a, a lack of investment and there are there is a demand locally from the groups that are active to try and take more um, ownership of of a community centre, but also I think as Matt and, and Tony pointed out, li linking it to building capability over the long term and ideally to um, re revenue streams that they can generate from those, often providing services which may be funded by the council. So it was a, a really good example of where this type of, of fund might, might work or, or, or there's certainly an opportunity for it. 
Yeah, um, great, that's really interesting. Um, Jane, you, you've um, indicated you'd like to speak and also in the chat, um, go to you. Yeah, also from Cambridge, I, I'll be short, that we shouldn't take, take the meeting, but uh, there is a real challenge in places where you've got individuals with high levels of income that, that are effectively our social private infrastructure becomes privatised. Um, so there are places where the, all of this stuff is happening and it looks very, very vibrant, but people on lower incomes can effectively be uh, entirely excluded. And that's a specific challenge to a place like us where we've got such high levels of, of inequality. Um, and that's difficult to see when you look at, you know, you look nationally, you wouldn't see the issues that we have in Cambridge because the data wouldn't, wouldn't, um, wouldn't put it on the table. And I think that's something we need to be really careful about and considerate that, you know, places, so if you're on a low income in Cambridge, it's incredibly difficult to access um, national support and resource at the moment. So it's it's a bigger job for us that we need to tackle. Mm. Um, I mean, how much is this, um, is this kind of approach chiming with what you guys are all doing anyway? How, is there other areas you identified that it would kind of spur on um, initiatives and, and approaches that you're developing anyway? Um, anybody want to contribute anything else from their, from their sessions? Stacey. I think I meant to put my hand up, but I clapped instead. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. Um, I was just going to say that Doncaster Council and in our, our breakout room, I'm sorry, guys, you've already heard this, but we're actually running a community wealth builder programme at the minute um, in Doncaster. So I work for the public health team. Um, and what we're trying to do is... Um, have a look at local commissioning. So we're working with local anchor organisations um, on commissioning and investment and, and really focusing on supporting our third sector organisations in local communities. Um, so we're trying to put the onus back on um, local authorities and, and large anchor institutions to look at their social value when they're looking at commissioning um, and put the investment back where it needs to be. So um, I think all of this for us is is fantastic because it, it's, it's put, we would, as a local authority, manage the fund and put that back into our VCF sector um, because we believe that they are the grassroots and, you know, the, the, the backbone of, of the local areas and our communities. Um, and we've obviously got quite a few micro communities that are on that, on the list um, that's on the website. So. That's really interesting. And what are the kind of challenges? Or do you, are, you, are you encountering kind of organisational barriers or anything to doing that? What, what, what would you kind of tell other people that wanted to do something uh, similar in their areas or get something else going? I think somebody already mentioned it, but um, when we go out as Doncaster Council, we do meet a lot more resistance than if we badge ourselves up as community wealth builder. So we don't have the council's logo on anything. We, we just go out with our own branding. Um, our own leaflets and, and we don't go out as um, as Doncaster Council because we do find that we just get the usual litter and all that sort of complaints you know that, that councils have to deal with but um, the project itself has been really successful and we've managed to support over 150 um, voluntary community sector organisations so far um, and that's from some, from very pre-start to start up. Um, so building that sector up and obviously working with some of the more established ones to, to develop them um, and look at their employment um, figures and everything else. So um, yeah, I would say um, we've got quite a, a tight knit community in Doncaster um, and we've got a really strong voluntary community sector already. Um, so we're quite lucky in that respect. But yeah, we, we really do believe that, that it's the inside out sort of approach. Yeah, and really interesting you, uh, what you're saying kind of chimes with, with what Bill said first about not necessarily going in as the local authority, but kind of starting a different conversation. Yeah. 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 Um, Mark, you, um, Mark Freeman, you put something interesting in the chat about this, the issue of kind of affordability of assets. I don't know whether you wanted to kind of elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, Anybody else say hands up or put something in the chat? Dare I say the last of the Cambridge contingent, I think. Um, but, but but I think for us it is that there is this real issue that uh, that if you're in an area where every scrap of land has a massive value to developers, then that makes it a lot harder for communities to be able to afford or, or to find uh, spaces um, that they can use. So, you know, we're seeing local community assets bought up by developers. 
um, and turned into to flats or houses um, all the time in Cambridge. And even if those uh, assets um, have been earmarked as of community interest, the community isn't able to raise the amounts of money that are needed to buy those properties because um, you know, the trustees, whether or not it's the trustees of a Methodist church or, or whatever, have a duty to do the best by the trust to, you know, they're selling it to get the most money and the community can't compete with, with the developers who are suddenly going to put 40 flats onto something that was uh, a communi community facility with a, a playground and, and grass and, and will become student flats. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, it's certainly something that will, there will be different challenges, right? There in different areas, depend, depending on the, the kind of values. Um, I'm just really interested to know, with largely a local authority um, audience, you guys, just kind of interested to get your sense of how, if something like this happened and was mainstream, what do you think would need to shift in terms of the local authority role? How would you see that kind of evolving in the future? Um, if, if there's this future of much more kind of direct investment um led by led by kind of hyper local communities and, and kind of shifting that that relationship oh a few hands that's that's great um bill i'll go to you first um and, and then the others yeah i think to be honest if, if the local authority acted as the accountable body in other words they held the money which was released then there's an accountability to the community but i think that it would be better that the community were the leaders not the followers because people always said to me <laughs> <coughs> excuse me we're sick of having it done to us we'd like to have a go at doing it ourselves and that's the big thing now is people do think that they have the ability to do things we have literacy numeracy and language problems but that shouldn't stop people giving the opportunity thank you um simon um sorry i'm from cambridge as well um <laughs> But uh, I, I just want to reflect on some of my experience because I, um, um, in prehistory, I was involved in a, a series of single regeneration budget programs, um, which um, I then evolved into neighborhood management programs, both in Cambridgeshire and in Hertfordshire. Um, and we do have areas of deprivation in Cambridgeshire, sort of with speech and uh, an overspill space in, in Huntingdonshire. And I just want to sort of play back some of the lessons that I learned from that, and the mistakes that I made. And I think the first thing that I would do in a programme like this is establish the capital that's in the, in the community, um, whether it's about family and friends, um, community involvement and networks, um, education and uh, skills and work, and actually the financial capital that they've got themselves. So you actually have a very comprehensive understanding of your baseline and, and, and where the community is at. And I think that plays into um, the prescription that Bill just gave, which was about talking to people. I wish I'd invested a lot more money in that, in that process of, of uh, engagement and, in, and involvement, because it was so easy to rely on the handful of community leaders that we, that we had. We also found that the local or the, the public sector regarded these areas as sort of no-go zones and, um, and that they actually neglected these areas. The service delivery you know, pro rata basis was actually very, very poor and it should have been the opposite. And I was, I was quite shocked by that. And mm. I think the only thing the programmes did is that we switched that round. We got much more attention <clears throat> being paid by the... Um, by the local authorities and the other public service providers, particularly in health, on these areas. And we started to innovate. And some of those innovations spilled out into the wider community. And one of the most remarkable ones is the Reading Recovery Programme, which became mainstreamed across the county. Um, but there were many other examples of the way in which we got um, mainstream uh, GP services located in these, in these areas and the redevelopment of community centres. Um, but I think the other thing I'd say is that it is an intergenerational problem. There is no short term fix for this. This has got to go from generation to generation. We had six year, seven year programs. But you need 25 years, frankly. You really need a long, long, long term commitment and you need to stick to it. Um, and I think the last point that's just been made about the accountable body, 
um, is absolutely right. Um, we had to devote so much resource to quarterly reports to a government office. There must be a landfill site somewhere in the southeast where all, all the reports we submitted to the government are dumped. I don't know who read them, but it, they were so so consuming. There's just that, that over that over accountability, the 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 um, the fear that other publics, the government has of local authorities when they hand money over to them that we're going to somehow squander it is ridiculous. And so, yeah, just lack of complete lack of trust. Um, and so I, I think that the notion that there is a separate institution that handles this money that with, a, with a clear brief from government to, to keep this going for a generation, um, that is the way forward here. And uh, to have placed trust in the in the in the like the multi agency partnerships that would deliver this at the local at local level, and, and ensure there was continuity between changes in political control. Not that we're going to see any in Cambridge because we're now solid Labour. I'm pleased to say. It's a really interesting point you make, isn't it, about kind of initiative bitus and the fact that things kind of come back, come kind of come full circle, don't they? But. I guess one of the things about this is that is that generational kind of commitment and yeah. people are then coming together to build relationships and trust on that kind of basis. And that's that's what's potentially quite powerful and different. Um, just coming to the final minutes, but Andrew, you had your hand up. I just wanted to go to you if you if you did want to come in. Um, I, I thought there was enough blokes talking, so I thought I'd, try, I'd dip out for a bit. <laughs> That's very nice of you, but you, you, you do, do feel free to contribute. Well, I, I just think that this is one. Uh, this is one of a number of pots of funding uh, that are out there, and so the, there is a job to be done, which is navigating all the different pots of funding that, that mm. are there, finding what's most appropriate, and that's probably one of the roles for the council, really, to to, to be the navigator for, for for communities and provide that expertise. Um, uh, I, it's great there's more money, uh, it's great there might be more money, and it's great that there are things to, to go for, but um, it, it is one of many pots, uh, and um, you sort of look at it and think, well, what's most appropriate? Yeah, that's it. yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I mean, and that's the, on one level, that's the kind of the challenge of, of, of where we are with kind of local government funding and, and, and funding for places. Um, and on another level, you, uh, yeah, you hint at some interesting kind of how, how that role might change to be that more kind of enabling um, and um, navigation uh, role on behalf of local authorities. Um, Tony, you had your hand up and I'm going to go back to, to Matt for some final final thoughts. Yeah, um, sorry, another bloke. Um, and I should add that mm -hmm. I've worked in Cambridgeshire for four years as well, a long time ago. So. Um, I wanted to ask what more we can do to help the campaign, if, uh, as, if you're going back to Matt. Um, I mean, we're, we're working on a levelling up strategy of our own for Birmingham, and I'm, I'm minded to suggest that we include all this as part of that strategy. And I don't know, I, I, we probably are involved, I don't know what we're, we're doing in terms of this campaign, Matt, but what else can we do and, and would, would it would things like including it in our strategies because i'm sure others are doing them as well uh would that help push things along and particularly perhaps if it's us putting forward the idea of an arm's length body rather than trying to grab the money for ourselves um that probably goes down pretty well with government and um, would that help as well brilliant question Tony and, and and actually that was, was going to be one of my final questions to Matt is is it just really interested in your reflections on on the discussion so far and what what are the kind of next steps for the for the campaign and and how can everyone um on the call help gosh there's lo lots of richness there in um particularly in the last few minutes I, I think there were a few points that, that were probably worth picking up and and and, and Simon from Cambridge um Sort of looks back to there's a rich history of of area based hyper local regeneration that I think we can learn from both in terms of what worked and what didn't work um, and I think it's interesting to to reflect that this is you know the last decade has been the first one probably since the 1970s in which we haven't seen a wave of this sort of investment so my my feeling is that you know whether it's through this fund 
or or another one we're going to see some, we're going to have to see something soon and if we do we need to we need to get it right and one thing we certainly can see when you look at the evaluations of the ndc program is that when you look back now at though where they took place the ones that were very much founded around community leadership seem to have left more sustainable results than the ones that were simply top-down administration of um you know of, of of, of, of projects by, uh, by 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 bureaucrats, and I, I think we we probably need to look at at how any new wave of investment and actually economic investment as well can be used in ways which builds sustainable community capacity, as well as improving the physical um, fabric a place. Agree absolutely at the point that this is this has got to be a generational project. Um, you know, far too many far too many places have benefited from short-term funding that either favours those already well equipped to to bid for it or alternatively is you know arrives in a way which encourages external agencies to go in and deliver a service for three years to a community before disappearing when the money runs out um leaving no nothing behind so we need to we need to get that right um actually i'm reminded of i was on a seminar with some american officials who are, who are taking forward something called the Community Revitalization Fund, which is a 10 billion pound fund aimed at um, aimed at turning around left behind areas in, in the US. And it was interesting that, you know, one, one of the questions asked of her was of, of, of the official was, you know, where do where might local authorities sit with a fund that actually uniquely in the US is going to be aimed directly at communities themselves from from national bodies? And, and her answer was, well, actually, great local authorities, there are great local authorities in the states and great mayors who work brilliantly with their communities, and they'll welcome those communities being given more resource so they can partner even more effectively with them. Um, there are some municipalities and some mayors that don't work so well with communities, and actually there, it would be good to get money down into communities to ensure that there's you know that people do start to come around the table together and i think the potential for using a fund like this to you know to broker really great local authority and community relationships to tackle problems that have been intractable and will take a long time to to turn around is you know is profound and important in terms of the campaign um sign up if you're not signed up please do sign up there are 50 um local authorities and combined authorities who signed up it doesn't cost anything um, you can go onto the community wealth fund website and, and and pledge support um if you want to be more active talk to your local um mps ask about what they're likely to do when the dormant asset bill comes to the house of commons um there's certainly been an awful lot of interest from across parties we'll see how much of it's manifest behind closed doors and how much on the floor of the house in in promoting um, solutions um, like like this. Um, there will be a I think report stage in the House of Lords in um, in about two weeks time, which um, uh, which there's a cross party amendment supported by peers from all parties and none, suggesting that a pilot community wealth fund be established with a couple of hundred million pounds to establish the principles before a larger scale uh, rollout. And I know that ministers have been meeting with some of um, those who've 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 signed up to the amendment to and I think they've expressed sympathy so we're not we're not seeing a closed door I I, th I think government may still want to go ahead with a formal consultation on on uses of dormant assets and I think if they do it'll be important that the support that we've seen from from local authorities and others to date and in parliament as well is then rolled into the consultation period and I think there's also a window as we go up to um, the levelling up white paper, um, which is probably, I guess, I guess, due maybe around the turn of the year on current plans, for a lot more pressure to be to be put. And I, I know, um, you know, we've we've been talking to people, for example, from the LGAs, people in places board about the extent to which, um, you know, we might sh share messages more effectively with local government. And I think increasingly, actually, and, it, and a lot of credit does go to to you, Jess, and and Adam for the work that you've been doing and the convening work that new locals been doing. But actually, you know, community has really got on the agenda um, right across the local government world, and this feels like something that that people might coalesce 
around and helping you know set the terms of that funding and establish a vision is, is something that you know all of you around the table today can do because frankly you've been working with communities and you've been working with the you know you're facing the problems that uh, that exist in communities where where social infrastructure has been run down where where local civic institutions have been hollowed out and I think you, because of that, you understand how important it is to, to start to try to rebuild that and to rebuild that in a sustainable way over the long term. I mean, great. Thank you so much. That's a really, really good note to kind of end on. Um, it's been a really good discussion. So good. We're two minutes over time. So I, I do apologise for, for that. Um, but I, I know there's lots more we could have discussed. Um, it's just been really, really good to kind of hear more about um, an idea that Feels whose time is coming. Um, it's great to be part of such a kind of wide coalition of organisations supporting something. Um, but also, I hope this discussion has just been of value in of itself to everyone and, and kind of kicked off a few ideas that that you might uh, consider in your areas or, or how, how to kind of take forward. And I hope you've made a few useful connections. Um, so thank you all so much for your contributions. Um, you will get an email um, with um, information about how to sign up for the um, Community Wealth Fund Alliance if you're not already a member um, and some of those actions that um, Matt referred to. Um, but just remains for me to say thank you so much to the Community Wealth Fund um, Alliance for partnering with us on this event. Um, and thank you all so much for, for making it such a, an interesting discussion. So um, hope you have a good rest of your day and goodbye. See you next time. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. Take care.